Greetings, programs. My name is Wretch, and I'd like to welcome you to Ian Livingston's Caverns of the Snow Witch. I'm back with another fighting fantasy game book, and if you're familiar with the channel, you know I've done quite a few of these. I did Judge Dread Countdown Sector 106, Steve Jackson's Starship Traveler, and I really like this format. For those of you who don't know what this is, this is essentially a one-man tabletop RPG, kind of a choose-your-own-adventure game when we were younger on steroids. Now, this looks to be a very interesting picture. I think this is from the original um, book that was published by Ian Livingston. Very eclectic, kind of provocative picture, so that's a good sign. And I checked to make sure that this was the same format as the other books that I played, so let's go ahead and restart it. Caverns of the Snow Witch is a fighting fantasy game book, an interactive adventure in which you are the hero. You can only win through by choosing the correct path, finding equipment, avoiding traps, and surviving combat. Before embarking on your adventure, you must determine your own strengths and weaknesses with a series of dice rolls. You have in your possession a sword, some leather armor, and a backpack containing provisions, food and drink for the trip. You've been preparing for your quest by training yourself in sword play and exercising vigorously to build up your stamina. Now we have to choose the difficulty setting, and we have free play, adventurer, and hardcore hero, which is a new mode I'm not familiar with. But Adventurer, as you can see here, is play Caverns of the Snow Witch exactly how Ian Livingston designed it, and that's what we want to do. Our starting stamina is going to be calculated by rolling 2d6 plus 12. And you have chosen the Adventurer difficulty mode. Before continuing, you must calculate your initial stamina. Your stamina score reflects your general constitution, your will to survive, your determination, and overall fitness. The higher your stamina score, the longer you'll be able to survive. You must roll two dice and add 12 to the number rolled. This is then entered in the stamina box on your adventure sheet. Stamina will go up and down during your journey, but if your stamina falls to zero, you die and your adventure is over. If your stamina is getting low, remember to eat some of your provisions. Now we're going to roll our starting stamina, and I need to see if, we, if there's a bug here. I call it slamming the table. Occasionally, if you don't like what you roll, if you hit the, if you click the mouse like an instant before the roll sets, the dice will pop up and roll something different, hopefully. So let's see if this bug is still here. Hopefully we won't need it. Starting stamina is 8. Your roll of 8 plus a base of 12 means your stamina is 20. Well, you know what? I think that's okay. That, yeah, stamina seems good. Next, determine your skill. Your skill reflects your swordsmanship and general fighting expertise. The higher, the better. Your starting skill is determined by rolling one die and adding six to the number. This is then entered in the skill box in your adventure sheet. So let's hope we roll high. Four or better. Hey, I'll take that. Your roll of five plus a base of six means your skill is 11. Alrighty. Next, determine your luck. Your luck score indicates how naturally lucky a person you are. Luck, and magic, are facts of life in the fantasy kingdom you are about to explore. Your starting luck is determined by rolling one die and add six to the number that is then entered in the luck box on your adventure sheet. So let's see how lucky we are. Eh. Your roll of four plus a base of six means your luck is ten. I'm actually going to take that. We will call that good. Next, you must choose a potion to take with you. In addition to your other starting equipment, you may take one bottle of a magical potion which will aid you in your quest. You may choose to take a bottle of any of the following. A potion of skill to restore skill points, and a potion of stamina to restore stamina points, and a potion of fortune restores luck points and adds one to initial luck. Oh. These potions may be taken at any time during your adventure except when engaged in battle. Taking a measure of potion will restore skill, stamina, or luck scores to their initial level. And the Potion of Fortune will add one point to your initial luck score before luck is calculated. Alright, so... Each potion contains enough for one measure, so remember to use wisely. Hmm. Well, we have rations for food. And our skill is pretty good. Our skill is at 11. So, let's go for luck. We could always go with more luck. And it'll add one to the luck um, trait, which is good. Are you sure you want to use the Potion of Fortune? Sure. What could go wrong? Once you have selected a potion, then your journey may begin. May the luck of the gods go with you on this adventure ahead. 
Okay, so we are committed. So we are going to pop up here and you see bookmarks and add bookmark. And these are places we can go back. So we will add a bookmark right here. Your position has been saved. Winters in northern Alancia are always cruel and bitter. The snow falls thick and the icy wind blows hard, chilling everybody to the bone. For the past few weeks, you've been hired by a merchant called Big Jim's Son to protect his trading caravans as they roll their way slowly north to the frozen outposts. The horse-drawn carts are laden with cloth, utensils, weapons, salted meats, spices and tea, which are traded for furs and ivory carvings made from mammoth's tusk. Big Jim is not usually worried about traveling north, as bandits only attack his caravans on the return journey. He is not alone in recognizing the value of the northern goods. On this particular trip, you are walking ahead of six carts across a frozen lake. In the distance, you can see the snow-capped peaks of the Icefinger Mountains jutting out of a low cloud. Your destination lies at the base of the mountains where the Northmen meet to trade. Snow is falling, but not too heavily. You stop to prod the ice with your sword to make sure it can bear the weight of carts, when suddenly the shrill call of a hunting horn breaks the silence. You stand up and run back to the carts to talk to Big Jim. He's sitting next to the driver of the second cart, puffing on a long briar pipe. A huge man with a great bushy beard, Big Jim is obviously a man to be reckoned with. His bright blue eyes scan the horizon, searching for signs of life. In a deep voice he says, Sounds like I came from the outpost. Reckon you can better go and investigate. Could be trouble. And get back quick. You set off straight ahead towards the outpost at the base of the Icefinger Mountains. You arrive two hours later at a scene of ugly carnage. The snow is red with blood, and all the wooden huts are smashed and tore down. Six men lie dead, their bodies slashed, their axes at their sides in the snow. Judging by the size of the footprints, the creature that attacked the outpost must have been enormous. There's nothing you can do for the unfortunate Northmen, so you head back towards Big Jim's caravan to report the news. You reach them in an hour, just as the daylight is fading, and relate the terrible events that have been fallen the outpost. Big Jim orders the carts to be drawn into a circle to protect his men during the night. A large fire is built into the center of the circle and you sit down beside it to talk to Big Jim. Everybody is nervous and a guard is posted to watch for signs of movement outside. In a low voice, Big Jim asks you if you will hunt the terrible creature, for otherwise his business will be ruined forever. You smile and reply that you will track the beast, but only for a purse of 50 gold pieces. Oh, I'm a mercenary. Big Jim's jaw drops open, and it takes a great deal of persuasion before he agrees to your demand. The snow finally stops falling as you settle down for the night. Sleep is a long time coming, for your mind is active with thoughts of the impending hunt. When you wake just after dawn, the fire is reduced to dying embers. Wisps of smoke rise gently into the morning mist, and not a sound's to be heard. You walk over to where Big Jim is sleeping and tap him on the shoulder. He wakes with a start, and you tell him that you are setting off and hope to be back later in the day. You wave to the guard as the snow starts to fall again, and make your way back to the outpost. Okay, by the time you reach the outpost again, the bodies are blanketed with snow and the beast footprints are covered over. The visibility is poor as you set off towards the mountains where you hope to find the abominable killer beast. The snow on the mountainside is soft and you sink in to your knees as you slowly climb up. You soon find yourself at the edge of a crevice which is spanned by an ice bridge. If you wish to cross the crevice by the ice bridge, or would I rather walk around the crevice? Well, perfect time for a bookmark. And let's go ahead and take the ice bridge. The bridge is quite narrow and very slippery. Oh, we test our luck already, huh? You're lucky. You need a ruck score of 10 and rolled a luck score of 5. Cool, I think we need to roll lower than what we have. So that's good. You tread carefully over the bridge. Safely across the crevasse, you continue your slow trek through the snow. Using your sword, you cut hand and toe holds into the side of the crevasse and haul yourself up. That's pretty smart. The wind starts to howl, blowing gusts of snow into your face. You put your head down and stride into it. Above the howl of the wind, you suddenly become aware of another sound the howling of wolves. You draw your sword while trying to peer through the snow. As if out of nowhere, two snow wolves appear in front of you, hunched ready to pounce. They are completely white except for their blood-red eyes, and suddenly one leaps at you. Well, time to fight! Awesome! Our first battle. 
And you hit the first Snow Wolf. That's good. So our stamina is still 20. 7. You hit the first Snow Wolf. You hit the first Snow Wolf. That's good. We don't seem to be taking any damage. Which is good. You have defeated the first Snow Wolf. Now you must face the second Snow Wolf. Alrighty. So it's taking into account our attack power. 11 plus 8 and then 8 plus 9. So we have 11 to... It's 8. Eh. That was bad. And you see, that just saved us from getting hit by slamming the table. Let's keep on going. Yep. You pop it up. Oh, the second snow wolf hits you. So we have to be careful with our popping up. Okay, you hit the second snow wolf. So we just got grazed for two. And we both missed, so that's a tie. So he has an 8 plus a 7. Hit the second snow wolf. We're getting there. One more to go. We'll pop it up. Oh no, that... You are triumphant. 20 to 19. That was close. Remember, slamming the table can work against you. And we won. You step past the still bodies of wolves and continue your journey through the swirling snow. The climb becomes steeper and the glowing, going is slow. I think we should make a cape out of the wolves. The snow is beginning to fall very heavily, swirling around in the strong wind. A blizzard is starting. So here we have another decision. If you wish to use your sword to dig a, shel a shelter in the snow, turn to 281. If you would rather press on... Let's add a bookmark. Well, we saw what happened to Luke on Hoth, so I think we're going to go ahead and use the sword to dig a shelter in the snow. You hurriedly cut blocks of ice out of the mountainside and build a makeshift igloo. You crawl into it as the blizzard blows down the mountain with ferocious power. Your body heat is retained inside the igloo and you keep warm. However, you must eat two portions of your provisions to regain your strength after the tiring walk and the effort of building the igloo. This does not increase your stamina. Ugh. An hour later, the blizzard dies down and you crawl out of your shelter to continue your quest. Hopefully that was the right call. Underneath an overhanging rock, you see a small wooden hut built against the side of the mountain. Its roof is piled high with snow and long icicles hang down from the window ledges. You see a set of deep footprints leading from the hut up the side of the mountain. Hmm. Well, let's go ahead and enter the hut. The front door of the hut is frozen shut, and you have to batter it with your shoulder to open it. There's only one room inside the hut containing the belongings of a fur trapper. Traps, furs, and sacks are stacked in a corner of the room. A wooden bed, a table, and a chair, and some cooking utensils show sign of recent use, and the ashes in the fire are still warm. If you would wish to put some logs on the fire and warm up the cold stew in one of the pans, turn to 118. If you would rather leave the hut and continue your quest, turn to 192. Sorry, I'm going to be very bookmark generous here. So, hmm. No, we're, we're fine right now. So let's go ahead and leave the hut and continue the quest. As you're about to leave the hut, you catch sight of some weapons lying under the bed. If you wish to take a couple of them with you, with you, or if you wish to be encumbered by the additional weight and would rather leave without the weapons, I don't want to steal the guy's stuff. I don't know whose cabin this is. Outside again in the deep snow, you set off on your trek up the mountainside, following the footprints in the snow. The high altitude and thin atmosphere makes you pant for breath as you continue your steady climb. You lose one stamina point. Eugh. Well, we are still alive. Oh crap. Suddenly you hear the cry of a human voice followed by a ferocious roar. Not far ahead, you see a fur trapper fighting for his life against a gigantic bear-like beast with long white fur and sharp teeth protruding from its jaws. It is the killer beast you've been hunting, the abominable Yeti. You watch the unfortunate trapper being gnashed or gashed by the Yeti's claws and falling face down in the snow. Incensed by the vicious attack, you scream at the Yeti and run through the snow to attack it. Are you carrying a spear? I do not have a spear. 
You draw your sword and lunge at the huge white beast. Well, time to fight. What do we got here? Skill of 11, so we, we are equally matched. So hope that I always roll higher. And I did not roll higher. Ow. We will fight on. No, quit rolling those double sixes. And we both tied. Nope. We're going to pop that up. And we just hit the Yeti. Table slamming for days, guys. And that was a tie. And we just hit again. Hitting it, killing a Yeti is not bad. That's a good thing to have on the resume. Yeah. Okay, hit on the Yeti. Pop. Ah, oh, he hit us. I couldn't slam the table in time. We're still doing good. 13 to 4. 8 to 8. We both miss. Epic duel time. Crap. See, that slamming the table just hurt me. 10 to 11. Yes. Not looking good. There we go. We will fight on. And I think this will finish him off. Okay. You kneel down beside the fur trapper and turn him over slowly. His eyes are barely open and blood trickles down from the corner of his mouth. The Yeti has gouged deep wounds in his chest and you realize there is no hope of saving him. With a great effort, he reaches up and grabs you round the neck, pulling you down so that you can hear his dying words. He thanks you for trying to save him and insists on telling you his secret. In terrible pain, he struggles to whisper his story. He tells you that he's lived in the mountains for most of his life, hunting animals and trading their furs, where for the last five years he's been searching for the legendary Crystal Caves. These caves have been cut out of a glacier by the followers of the Snow Witch, a beautiful yet evil sorceress who is trying to use her dark powers to bring on an ice age so she can rule supreme over the whole world. The entrance to the Crystal Caves is high up on this very mountain. It is open, but hidden by an illusion. The unfortunate fur trapper found it by accident only yesterday when he saw one of the Snow Witch's warriors seemingly walk straight through an ice wall and disappear. The trapper left a piece of fur hanging over the entrance so he could find it again the next day. Sadly, the Yeti has put an end to his hopes, and he asks you to enter the caves to slay the vile Snow Witch and leave her followers without their leader. There are legends about great treasures being frozen into the wall of the Snow Witch's lair which would provide ample reward. The fur trapper suddenly grips you hard and then falls back silently into the snows, into the snow. He's dead. You cover him with snow before deciding what to do. Fifty gold pieces await if you return with evidence of the Yeti's death to Big Jim's son, but the thought of a quest through the crystal caves beneath Icefinger Mountains excites you, and you decide to set off to find them. I would really like to get some health, because I am not, I am not good. Now that the snow has stopped falling, the sky is clear and blue. The air is cold and crisp, and the snow crunches beneath your feet. Slowly you make your way up the mountainside, looking for the cave entrance marker left by the fur trapper. Suddenly you hear a distant rumbling from above, the terrifying sound of an avalanche. Okay. You need a luck score of 9 and rolled a luck score of 5. Now, your luck actually goes down every time you roll, so it's harder and harder to stay lucky. But we are lucky indeed. You look up to see great cascades of snow tumbling down the mountain. Fortunately, the avalanche sweeps down a ridge adjacent to the one you are climbing. What luck! You make your way up slowly up the mountain until you reach a rock face that is too steep to climb. You walk around the side until you see a massive wall of ice which completely blocks a gully between two peaks of the mountain, the glacier. Your heart leaps up as you catch sight of a piece of fur left hanging on the wall of ice by the trapper. Although you cannot see the entrance, you walk straight ahead. You shut your eyes as you think you're about to walk into a wall of ice, but you walk straight through the illusion and find yourself inside a long tunnel carved into the ice. You walk down it and soon arrive at a T-junction. Alright, new bookmark. If you wish to turn left or you wish to turn right. Well, I am left-handed, so we will go ahead and turn left. A tunnel bends round to the right. As you turn the corner, you almost bump into a tall, pale-skinned humanoid coming the other way. He's wearing a white cloak with a hood pulled up over his head. He's a mountain elf, one of the Snow Witch's followers. Hmm... 
so we can choose to walk past him, tell him we've come to join the Snow Witch's followers, or attack him with a sword. Let's add the bookmark. Hmm. Should we try the subtle approach? Let's go with that. Let's tell him we've come to join the Snow Witch's followers. The Mountain Elf looks at you in disbelief and says, Nobody of good heart would wish to join the Snow Witch. I'm only here because of this. Throwing back Hood, the elf reveals a metal collar around his neck which glows in the semi-darkness. Only the obedience collar makes me serve her. Her voice continues in a dour voice. Hmm. Now... If you would rather change your story and tell the elf that you intend to slay her, if you wish to reiterate your desire to join, let's go ahead and do that because if we tell the elf that we are going to try and slay her, She's... he's probably going to try and kill us. The Mountain Elf shrugs his shoulders and says, Well, don't say I didn't warn you. You won't get a chance to change your mind once you're wearing that obedience collar. Follow the tunnel to where it branches and take the right fork. Good luck. You thank the Elf for his advice and set off again. You soon arrive at the fork in the tunnel that the Mountain Elf mentioned, and assigned to take his advice, you enter the tunnel to your right. Further ahead, in the left-hand wall of the tunnel, you see a gap. You walk up to it and peer around to see a cave in which a Neanderthal is stripping the skin off a moose, making it ready for the large simmering stew pot behind him. He is working very slowly and being yelled at by the gnome cook who is wearing a white apron and waving a wooden spoon in the air. If you wish to enter the crude kitchen, turn to 95. Yeah, let's go ahead and enter the kitchen. What could possibly go wrong? The gnome runs up to you and shouts, Get out! Dinner will not be ready for another two hours! You'll hear the bell! Mind you, you look a little worse for wear, so you can have this stale cake if you wish. The gnome pots, points at a piece of cake lying on the table. Ooh. Let's go ahead and take the cake and leave, because the cake is not a lie. Birthday cake, even if it's not your birthday. <laughs> you leave the cave and turn left, back into the tunnel, eating the cake as you go. It is stale and virtually tasteless, but gives you a little energy, and you gain one stamina point. So, our stamina is now at 10, which could be worse. Now, we could eat some provisions and get our stamina back, but we're not in any real danger, I don't think. In the distance, you hear chanting voices. Before long, the tunnel ends at the entrance to a large cavern. Kneeling down before an ice effigy in the shape of a demon, their hooded faces pressed to the ice floor in worship are ten of the Snow Witch's followers. There are two exits from the cave, one to your left and one to your right. If you are wearing a cloak, turn to 384. If you're not wearing a cloak, turn to 260. Well, this is certainly not going to end badly. You breathe in deeply and walk casually through the cavern towards the tunnel to your right. You're almost at the entrance of the tunnel when the worshippers stop their chanting. They stand up and one of them calls out to you, asking why you did not stop to sing the praises of the Frozen One. Oh, uh, if you have a magic flute? <laughs> All of these things! Um, hmm, well we could try to fight them. Let's go ahead and add the bookmark. And, sure, let's try and fight them. The followers are a group of goblins, orcs, and Neanderthals. Oh lord, mistakes were made. There are too many of them for you to overcome, and you soon are captured. They drag you over to a circle of ice, dyed blue, in which the effigy stands. Amid wails and wild shouting, they throw you into the blue circle. The effigy immediately jerks its frozen limbs into motion, and you have unleashed the power of an ice demon. The ice demon unleashes a jet of freezing gas that shoots out from its nostrils. Uh, roll two dice. Oh dear. Sadly, you failed a skill check. I am about to die. You are hit by the freezing gas in which hampers your ability to fight. You prepare yourself to attack, and skill is reduced by two for the duration of the fight. Awesome! Let's do this. We still, we're equal on skill, and almost on health, too. Okay. We hit the ice demon. Pop it up. Five to five. So far, so good. Oh, that's not good. That's not good either. That's good. 18 to 15. That is not... I didn't even think to pop it. 
10 to 2. I like that. 9 to 6. And pop it up. That's a good good choice though. There we go. That's a dead ice demon. The ice demon crashes to the floor in a pile of broken ice. The Snow Witch's followers fall back in terror, afraid that you might now possess the demon's powers. You gain one luck point. Unchallenged, you're able to leave the cave by the tunnel exit. The tunnel ends quite soon at a T-junction. To your left, you can hear cries for help. Alright guys, well we're going to add a bookmark here, and I think this is where we're going to end it. Um, we are not in the best state, but we do have provisions. I'm going to go ahead and try those here in a bit and see if those help. But I hope you guys are enjoying it so far. I'm kind of digging. This is kind of like what I would imagine Jon Snow um, doing when he went beyond the wall. But if you like the video, go ahead and click like down below. Subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment. That'd be a big help. And we'll see you next time. Later days, everyone.